Um, so one of the things that we did yesterday is we set up this config object with all of our different pieces that we need to connect to the database. Um, but you saw I hard coded all the stuff right now, right? So it would be better, right, if that stuff came from environment variables. Um, and we did part of that already. We kind of showed you how to do some of that. So I could go in here and say process dot env dot whatever the name of the variable is here. So here I would maybe use db name because it'd be the name of the database, right? So then I can at least pull it from each of these from environment variables instead of them being hard coded in the code. Okay. So what I want to show you first today is we're going to use a package called config, which is going to make it easier to do that, um, as well as to kind of document your configuration that you have across all your app all of your application because um, otherwise things kind of get spread around in your in your program about what different things you need to configure right so we've got this here right now this is in server js eventually this will move over to another file so you won't be able to find it here um, and right now we've got this configuration down at the bottom of the page right and we also have to remember that i need to set debug so i've got like two three I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've got like 10 pieces, of config, 10 pieces of things I'd like to configure, but I'd like them to all be set in one place. Okay, so that's what config is going to let us do. It's going to put all that configuration into just a few files. And it's also going to give us sort of a hierarchical look at it. So if you go out to NPM and you look up the config package, um, you'll find the documentation here. It kind of gives you some examples of, of what this looks like. And basically, you need to create, we're going to need to create four different files. They're all going to go into a folder called config. Um, and they, they behave very similarly, but they're going to be a little bit different. Um, so the first one we need to do is set up the kind of connections. I'm, I would set up the ones that, that tell it which environments variables to pull from. Okay, um, and maybe I should install the config package first. So let me actually do, let me do that. So I'm going to create a terminal, npm install config. Okay, so I've installed config, and we can see that in my package JSON here. I've got version 3.3.2. Okay. So I need to create a folder next, and that folder specifically has to be called config. Um, so I'm going to create the folder just at the root. Same level as data and all of that. Yep, same level as, as everything else. So we're going to create a config. Now, inside of there, we're going to need to create a few files, and these are kind of names you want to remember. Um, most of them are pretty short. This first one's a little bit long, unfortunately. So the first file I need to create is called custom dash environment, custom environment variables dot json <laughs> yes yes custom environment variables so that's the name of the first one and it's separated by by dashes for each word um, the extension is .json, which means this is going to be a JSON file, right? Similar to how you're pack, you've got a package.json, it's a JSON file, okay? So this allows us to create um, configuration that's actually not just flat, uh, it actually lets us add levels to it um, and, and kind of groups some settings together. Um, so what I want to add in here is, is basically a place for each of the different configuration pieces that I need. Um, so the first one I'm going to add in is going to be debug. And, and this is more as just a way of documenting that we are using the debug environment variable. This really isn't going to be something I'm going to use. 
it just helps me when I'm looking back at the project and trying to see what environment variables do something um, that makes it easier to look it up. Okay, so debug. And so what I'm saying is this is the name of the configuration property and here is the environment variable it comes from. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to add HTTP. But this one's going to be kind of a, a section, right? So I'm going to group all the things that go together with, with HTTP into this, this object. Okay, so in there I've got two settings. The first one's going to be the host name. And I'm going to pull that from the host name environment variable. I'm also going to add port. What are we doing here? Uh huh. What's the big picture? So we're setting up the config package. We're changing how we do our configuration. So. Rather than kind of pulling directly from environment variables, we're going to kind of use this in between. Okay, so so I've got HTTP, right? And you see I've got the host name and the port. And if I were to look at the bottom of server JS, right? You see right now I'm pulling both of these from environment variables, right? So I'm pulling it from environment variables, and then I'm also saying, well, if it's not there, then use localhost. If it's not there, use 3000. Uh, but sometime, you know, so, so those are both pieces I want to get into these configuration values, both what environment variable does it come from and the defaults. Um, so, but those two pieces are going to actually go into different files. So one file will contain the names of the environment variables and the other one's going to contain the default values. Um, one of the upsides of doing that is, let's say you need to use that configuration parameter multiple places now across your code, you can just pull it from config. You don't have to duplicate this code anywhere. Uh, so it's going to simplify what you have right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so here's what I have. So I have HTTP, and then the next section, which is the, the main one we care about right now, is DB, database. Okay. So I've got a section for my HTTP. I've got a section for my DB. Okay, so what configuration settings do I need to add in here? For what do I need to know about my database to connect to it? Huh? The name of the database. Okay, good. Okay, so so let's start with that. So I need the database. I'm going to pull that from the DB name environment variable. You said I needed a port. What do I usually need to know before I know the port? I need to know which computer it's on, right? Or the host. Okay, so the host says which computer is your database running on. Okay, so I'm going to pull that from the DB host environment variable. And I'll have my port. I'm going to call that DB port because remember I already have a port environment variable that controls where the server is. So I need this separate environment variable for where the, the database server is. So the, you got the web server and you've got the database server. It has to be in that format, right? It has to be exactly like that. Either... What do you mean exactly like well, that? It seems like you're taking arbitrary there because you already have four well, so so what's here? This is this is this is mandatory um, because MySQL needs these names specifically on the left um, to do the connection. Um, it, as long as we use those same names, then, then things become easier. The blue is mandatory. I would still ask that you use the same names that I am uh, because then I can run your. It's going to make it possible for me to run your application on my computer. Okay. Um, because I'll have some environment variables set up um, to do certain things. What does this have to do with the .n file? Um, so the .n file, remember what it does, it kind of, 
sets the environment variables if they're not set. So for instance, this would actually be at pulled, like port here, it would go look at the .n file and pull that value and then stuff it in here, HTTP port. So, so we are connected. Okay, so I need the password. I'm going to pull that from DB pass. And then remember we set up pooling. So that's the connection limit. And that's going to come from DB pool. And I should type that right. Spell it right. Okay, so that's what I'm going to put in custom environment variables.json. Oh, yes. Um, and basically, if you if you pay attention to this, right? So you see those five variables here. Notice that they have the same name as what I did here yesterday. That's important. That's why I'm picking those names in blue. Okay. Um, so that says this is where the environment variables come from. So we know what the environment variables are named. Um, oh, yes, I skipped over user. You're right. Um, so, but the point is this centralizes what all of those environment variables are. Um, so I can look in this one place and know, okay, these are all of the environment variables that you use. And especially things like, okay, well, maybe you want to connect to some web API out there, such as YouTube or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. Then you can put those details in here as well. Um, so again, they're all localized in one place. Okay. Uh, the next thing we want to add, we specified the environment variables. We want to specify default values for these settings. So in addition to this file in the config folder, I'm going to add a new file. We're going to call that default.json. Okay. Now default.json is going to have a very similar structure. Okay. I'm going to tell it what the default values are for each of these different pieces. So for instance, I want to tell it what the default value is for the HTTP settings, right? So for HTTP, I want it to default to a host name of localhost and a port of 3000. And then for the database, I'm going to default it to that. So the first file we said, here's the name of the property or name of the configuration and the environment variable it comes from. And here it's basically the same. It's just the thing on the right is the default value if that environment variable isn't set. How's everybody doing on the stream? Doing yeah, pretty good. good. I'll have to switch over to my phone. My internet is messing up. But... We'll see. Okay. So we've got our environment variables. And we've got our default values. We'll go through the Google.js and clean that up. Maybe. Yeah, we'll come back to that in a minute once we get this set up. We've got two more files to create, but the next two files will be They only have two characters in them.
So two more files that we need to create are called development.json and production.json. So development.json and production.json. Now all you need to put into those files is just a pair of curly braces. Production.json and development.json just need to have an open and closing curly brace. So, because they just need to exist as far as config gives you an error if you don't create them, um, but we're not actually going to use them to do anything. So, the purpose of the development.json is to give you settings that you only want to apply while you're testing the application, while you're testing it locally or running it in development mode, as we say, um, versus the production settings are settings you only want to use when you've deployed it when it's live. Um, now, the reason that I'm not going to put anything in there is because both of those cases are better solved by environment variables. The, the settings that you want to be different between development and production, it's better to just set those up as environment variables. So these files will stay empty. Does that make sense? So why are you making them? Um, because config requires them. If you don't create them, then config will give you an error as soon as you try to read the config. Cool. Oh, can you show me the default.json again? Because I think I may have done something wrong. I just want to make sure I got it right. Um, it should be basically all the settings that we currently have in server.json. Okay. So okay. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much a cut, copy and paste. Okay. So now that we've got it working, we actually need to kind of wire it up. Right. So we've got all our configuration files set up. I need to now go back to what we usually do, which is require the package, right? So in here, I'm going to say const config equals require config. Okay. So I brought in the config package, and I need to tell it um, how I want to kind of get those, those values. So in here, you see I'm getting this database config object, but I'm kind of constructing it myself. I'm going to remove all the code on the right of that equals, and I'm just going to say config.get and I'm going to tell it to get DB. So that means it's going to get everything that we put there under the DB kind of section. All of those connection details. So it's going to get it. It's going to read that JSON. Going to look at, override it potentially with, over, with the environment variables. And now we have our database config. Does that make sense? So now they're, you know, we've got our default values in there and we've got our environment variables. So it's all configurable. I can have the database name be something different in production. I can have the, the username and the password change. Um, so that that's tremendously helpful as far as keeping your configuration kind of sorted. Cool. Um, so so get is basically the only method that you'll need to use with the config package. That's it. You just say, I, what, what config parameter do I want to get? Now, let's look at the, the HTTP real quick. So with the HTTP, I'm going to kind of do the same thing. For the host name, I'm going to say config.get. But remember now, it's two tiers down, right? So it's in HTTP.hostname, right? So when I say get, I'll say HTTP dot hostname, and similarly with the port, I'm going to change this config dot get. Uh, what's that? Any on there? Okay. 
And it's just IntelliSense telling you. In theory, it could be any type, but in reality, it's not really any type. So that's that's all I got to change there to pull those two values from uh, from the config package. Okay, does that make sense? Are you kind of starting to see the value of that? It's, it's a little bit of shortcutting. The main part is it's reducing, it's A, reducing code, code duplication, right? Because you don't want to have the default value here is 3 and the default value here is 4. Um, it's also a matter of putting all that configuration in one place because once you get to an application that's got 100 files, right, and that configuration may be spread around in a bunch of different files, it can be hard to track down, especially for a new developer that's trying to get your application running. They have to kind of go through the entire application and go find what environment variables are there that they need to set up, right? Uh, so a new developer can come onto the team and they can just look at, in default, they can see what the default, all the default values are and and what things they might need to configure, right? And and how they, they can look at the environment variable file and see, okay, this is this is the environment variables I use to set those things. Right? And if I for some reason maybe you know maybe this is a maybe one of these names is wrong. Maybe I want to change this this environment variable to be something else. Maybe I want to change it to be DB password later on instead of DB pass because something else is using that environment variable. I just go change it here, right? So it's all about centralizing your configuration. That's what it's about is getting it on one place rather than strewn across your code. So right now, so environment variables don't have values to them for default. Correct. Yeah. If you don't have any of these, if you don't have the environment variable set then it uses the default value. Okay. So I can over I can still override them, right? This effectively sets that your env file still sets environment variables. So I can still set these things through env, right? It just means so I can set it through env or I can set it through um, your actual system environment variables. Mr. Smith, do you, so how long does an environment variable actually stay in the system for? Um, well, it depends on how long you set it. So it depends on how you set it. So if I set an environment variable um, in the, remember I went into environment variables in your system? So like if I go in here, env environment variables, which is this is where I would recommend you set a secure username and password, is you go set it actually here. So rather than using maybe admin and password, you might want to go set something more secure. And that way you can put the secure password here and you don't ever have to type it into your code. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. So those, okay. Okay. So that's the type of environment variables. Okay. Yeah. Same thing whenever you're installing like Apache for, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. For Maven or something. So, so, okay, so if I just want to, if I want to have a, a good random environment, random password, I just put it in here. It's never in my code. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes more sense. I was confused for a second uh, what kind of environment variables you're talking about, but that clears it up now. So, so these ones live on, once you set them, they're there until you, until you remove them. If I do something over the command line, though, um, by default, those ones only last as long as the session. Right? So, so I can set environment variables in the command line. Let's say I bring up my terminal here. Um, um, I can actually set environment variables through the terminal here, um, but they only last through the session. So as soon as I close the terminal, those are gone. So that makes so, sense. So you can yeah, actually... One more question I had now is, so let's say that um, you have like two different passwords. So does that mean you have to set a different environment variable if you're trying to use two different passwords and you're trying to use an environment variable? That's a place where I would put it into, if you're, if you need to, if you didn't hear that, if you need two different passwords for like two different applications, 
Um, what I would do, there's or like databases, you know, like Redis and Mongo or something like that. There's there's two ways. There's a few ways to do that. You could instead of setting that in system environments, you could set that through the the dot env, right? Because I have a do different dot env for each project. Um, the other way that you can do that is so. Remember when I was looking at the environment variables here? Did you notice that I set them under a a user? Does everybody see this? I'm setting this under user Paul Smith. So what I can do is I can create another user account on the computer, and then that user account is kind of what runs the system, right? So if I if I had different user accounts, I could say, well, um, this this server, this application is being run under this user, and it has these environment variables, or this other user has these environment variables, um, and that's kind of if you're setting up a like a VM. Right, so you can kind of sandbox your application in a single user. Um, but in general, for you, for what we're doing in class, if you need different things, I would just put it in your .env. What was, what did you put for? How did you get from that? If you just type into your search, you go e, dot e, You just go env for environment variables, and I guess it's showing off off the side of the projector. Um, but I'm going to click on Edit System Environment Variables. That's what gets me in here, and then I click environment variables down at the bottom. That's how I get here. A Windows only thing. Isn't it? So um, this is the way to get here on Windows, but every operating system has this. Mm -hmm. So do we need to? Because I don't have the TV pack. Do we have to with the add? I would recommend you you change your password, right? You have an admin account, but change the password, and then put whatever that new password is here. Does that make sense? Because you probably don't want to leave your password as password, right? That's not terribly secure. Uh, how did you get those things? Sorry, this? I missed this. Like, yep. I don't me. Have anything like that. So let me remove. Let me let me remove them because I've got three already set in here. So I'm going to hit new. Can you see the new button? And we should all do this. Yeah, you probably all want to do this. Okay. Um, so the first one I have in here is debug. And I've set debug to app colon star. Uh, and that just means that if I forget, that means that that kind of overrides all the applications. So I make sure that I'm always seeing app colon star. OK. okay. So that's one, deep, one environment variable I've got there. Um, DB user, I set to admin. And the reason I'm doing that is because this is my login credentials for me on my computer. Your user account and, and password may be different on your server, right? Or it might even potentially be different between your laptop and your desktop, and that's okay, right? If you have two different computers, you might have a different admin and pa a different username and password. Yeah, this is just for the database. Yeah, so this is for the database. So I'm saying db underscore user. I'm setting that to admin. And then right now I'm setting db pass, because that's what I called it, and I'm going to set that to password. Now, the, again, this is probably something you want to change. You probably want to go in there once you create it, and, and later down the road, you know, after after we're done here, you'll probably want to go change that to a different password. Okay, um, I, I see what we're doing, but I'm not getting the link between this and the uh, database that we're doing the environment right, so these are environment variables, right? Notice sure. the names that I used here, DB pass and DB user. How does that on its own, what, what benefit does that bring the outside of what we just did there? It means that I can set those outside of my program. Because they exist now. Right, so they exist. So these, these two settings here that I have here mm -hmm. will override the default value, right? So the default value here is admin and password. I can oh, okay. use those two passwords to set them to something it's else. Kind of a fallback. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's not a fallback. It's an override because it takes prefer, pref, precedence, okay. but right? What I mean is because uh, uh, a fallback would be later in the chain. It's actually mm -hmm. earlier in the chain. All right. I'm just, right. The reason I'm so concerned is thinking it's not going to work mm -hmm. later. Okay. Well, it will work. I can I can tell you that much. It will work. So, that's that's how we usually set up those kind of things. Is it 
Um, yes, it does. Um, the user variables override the system variables. Um, system variables are available across the entire system. Uh, however, the user variables uh, don't require you to reboot your computer. They just require you to reboot the application. Whereas the system environment variables require you to completely reboot your computer. Does that make sense? So you can set it technically on either place. Just recognize that the user one has a higher precedence um, and it doesn't require a full reboot of your computer. Um, it still means stopping the server and VS code and such, but um, it doesn't require you to completely reboot Windows. Okay, so, so that's why I usually set that in there. Um, your mileage may vary. You may still need to reboot your computer for both of those. Um, but that's that's why I, I do it there, because I usually don't have to completely reboot the system. It, it also is a little bit more private, because then if I have more than one user on my system, they don't see my the system variable. I mean, they don't see the user variables. They just see system variables. So um, that's the config package. Okay. So a lot of questions that we answered there. Um, but but are there is that good? Anybody got any outstanding questions? So so that's something the the config package is something I expect you to use with any application that we have a database from this point on. You know to store your configuration. Um, it's basically just going to be the almost the same thing for every project. So um, the only thing that we're really changed for the most part from project to project is the the name of your database right the rest of that is pretty constant does that make sense because this most of this applies to any application okay so the next thing i want to do is we're going to look at connects okay so we set up the server yesterday and we, we, we told it to run two select queries, right? So it's running one select query when you go to the, the home page to list all of the products. And we're running a different select query um, to show a single product. Okay. And one of the things that we kind of noticed, right, is this, there's an opening here for SQL injection. There's an opening for um, your users to do something very nefarious, like delete all your data, um, if we just leave it as such. Um, now, there is a way around this. Um, using MySQL directly, what you have to do is you have to switch to what we call prepared statements. So rather than building a string, you kind of say, hey, here's a, here's a placeholder, and then you let the database inject, like, Put the put the variable in that place instead of using string concatenation or using uh, template strings. Okay, uh, but I'm going to switch it over to connects. Um, yeah, let's look at what that is. So, looking on the npm registry, package is named connects, um, and here's kind of what they what they say about it. So, it's a batteries included multi dialect query builder for node. Okay. So one of the things that we see in there, multi-dialect, this actually works with pretty much any SQL database. Um, you can pick it up and, and use it with another database without really having to change your card for the most part. Because um, what it does is it effectively kind of allows you to build the SQL instead of writing the SQL directly. Um, so it deals with some of the differences in, in syntax between, say, MySQL and Postgres and SQL Server, etc., cetera, um, so that we don't have, so that our code is a little bit more agnostic, if it may, if I may say. Um, the other thing that happens there, let's say I want to build some sort of search interface, and I want to say, well, sometimes maybe the user wants this filter by category, not filter by category, right? Maybe they want to say, I only want products in this range, or not, right? So sometimes I may want to add logic or not, right? So I could do that, just building up the string, I'd have to do what? Probably string concatenation of some sort, right? To build up that code. Um, and you can do that, but there's a lot of kind of gotchas there. 
right? There's a lot of gotchas if you're putting it together. Um, so this also, so this deals with that. Um, the other big reason why we're actually doing the switch, um, you saw that uh, MySQL is using callbacks, right, for their asynchronous behavior. Um, the way that Flu uh, connects is built, it actually uses promises. Um, so promises turn out to be a lot easier to write asynchronous code, especially as your code starts getting more complicated. Does that make sense? Um, now, there are ways that you can take that and kind of build or build your own wrappers around that and turn the callbacks into promises, um, but this already takes care of it. Um, so this is what we're going to switch over for, for connecting to the database. Okay, so looking at their example, the, the way you get started is not too hard. Uh, I think I'm, again, off the screen. Okay, so you can see the example here. So in order to create a connection, which actually ends up creating a pool, similar to how we just did with MySQL packets directly, we're going to say quants connects. So connects is kind of the our connection pool uh, for a query builder. We're going to say require connects. So bring in the connects package. And then you see the parentheses here and there. So we're bringing it in and then immediately calling it as a function. And what we pass in is then some information about how to set it up, right? So the first thing I put in here is the client. So in this example, they're saying the client is SQLite. What is our client? MySQL, My right? So the, the name that you put here is the name of the package that's kind of driving your, your database connection. So we're going to use MySQL. If we wanted this to be, say, Postgres, then I would put Postgres here. Um, and then beneath that connection, that's where we're going to put our in our, our DB con configuration stuff. Okay. So, so using that, what's the first thing I need to do anytime I want to bring in a new package? Okay, install it. And maybe before that, I need to stop the server. Right. So. So let's stop, make sure the server stopped, and then go and install it. So npm i connects. Okay. It's going to take a minute to download. All right. So I've got connects installed. So now we can use it. So I'm going to go back up here. You see this line 12 where I have the, the pool? I'm constructing the pool. So instead of constructing the pool, I'm going to build my, I'm going to create my query builder. So const connects is equal to require connects. Okay. And I need to then configure it. So our client is going to be MySQL. And then the connection is all that configuration variables that we already set up. So connection is equal to just database config. So that's how I open my connection or kind of set up my pool. So now Connects knows what, what kind of database we're connecting to, and it also knows the, the password and the name of the database, etc. Okay. 
Okay. So now let's go down to you see this is the home page, right? I'm going to comment that out real quick. Because I'm going to use connects to now run that query instead. So in order to run the query, the first thing connects wants to know is what table do I want to query? What table do I want to work with? Right? So which table are we using in this select statement? Products. Okay. So products. Okay. Um, and then I want to say which columns do I want to select? And I I specify that using the select statement. So I'm just kind of I'm going to do this through chaining. I'm kind of building up the query piece by piece. So I specified the name of the table. I need to specify what columns I want. And here, just like in the previous select statement, I'm just going to ask for all of them. So I'm going to ask for all of the columns. And then I might want to say, well, let's let's maybe impose some order on them, right? Here I didn't actually order them, but I probably should, right? Maybe I want to order them by the name of the product, right? So let's add in order by clause. So order by name. Okay. So I now have that's basically building my query. Okay. That's basically building out the select statement. Just with a, a different sort of syntax. Okay. Now remember what I said is this uses promises, right? So promise is a way to kind of run asynchronous code, um, but it makes it easier than callbacks. Because um, you can kind of chain things together and say, well, do this and then do this and then do this um, a little bit more linearly um, than you can with just the callbacks. Because otherwise you end up with callback inside a callback inside a callback, right? So what I want to tell it to do, um, because this is a promise, I'm going to say dot then. And when that happens, I need to tell it to do something. Now, I'm going to push this down a few lines to make this easier to read. So I'm going to reformat a little bit. Connect, select, order by, then. So that's going to make the chaining easier to read. Okay. Now, when I get the results... So remember with our callback, we called this results and do the same kind of thing. Results is going to contain um, the values that come back. So then I get my results. And what do I want to do when I get my results? Render the whole page. Okay. So I'm going to take this here. So in response to in response to that, I might push it here. Um, and maybe I need to push, maybe, maybe I want to put in curly braces to push that down a line so it's a little bit easier to read. You with me so far? So then says, what do you want to do when I get the results of the promise? Okay. So the results of the promise are, are this. It's what's what comes back from our query. Okay. Now, remember, I also need to deal with errors. Right? So when I've got this set, set up, I said, well, if there is an error, then do next error. Right? Um, so if I'm writing code that might fail, right, in C-sharp, what do you usually do with, with things where there was exceptions? What structure did you usually use? 
try catch. Okay. Um, so the method I call is actually a very similar one. I just call it catch. So if there is an error, and, and I need to make sure that this catch is, is basically towards the end. It needs to be the last thing. If there is an error, then we pass it on to that next callback. So that's it rewritten with next. Any questions? Okay. Um, let's check it real quick just to make sure we haven't broken anything. So let's try to go to the home page. And I think my server is not running because I stopped it to install the package. There we go. Let's try that again. There we go. So you should be seeing this. Is anybody not seeing the products page like that? Yeah. Got a there and there somewhere there. Uh huh. Uh, oh. It's Yes, because we haven't fixed that page. If we fix this page, we haven't fixed the other page. So connects is what we call a, a query builder, right? So so whole point being here, you don't write the SQL directly, you kind of call a bunch of functions that build the SQL form. Okay. So we see that that's the that's the code I've got here. Let me go toss this in. Discord. Okay. So given that, I need to do the same transition over here, right? I need to do that same kind of change. I need to can use connects here for the, the product page. So what do I start it with? Huh? So you write connects, okay. You'll notice I've still kept the ID here because I still need to know that ID. Connects products, right? It's the name of the table. Okay, what else do I have in my select statement? So I've got select star. What's next? Um, we'll only have one result, so we don't have to order it. Um, and the order by would come usually last. Okay. What do I have? What do I have in this, this statement here as well? I've got a where clause, right? Um, and, and a good guess would be, well, maybe I need to write call the where function to put in a where clause. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to then say which field am I comparing? I'm comparing the ID and I'm comparing it to my local variable. So that's all you have to write there. 
where ID comma ID. If you wanted it to be a different comparison, um, I believe you put the comparison operator in between. So while we're kind of looking at this, um, there's a lot of good documentation um, for connects. If you go out to the connectsjs.org website, they've got basically all of these documented. Um, and one of the ones I, so I can look over here on the left, you see the query builder section. Um, so for instance, if I want to look at the where method and see some examples for it, they kind of show you if you do this, then this is the kind of SQL you're generating. So if I say with, if I say where ID one, well, I'm generating where ID equals one. If I wanted to say here, you see how they say where ID is greater than 10. So that lets me put a different comparison operator than equals. See that? So it's basically generating, it's kind of generating that, that SQL for you and it will show you kind of the comparison. Here's what it looks like in JavaScript and here's the SQL that you get. Okay. So I don't need to do an order by because I'm only getting one result. So do I have the full query in here? Is that everything I need? Huh? Okay. So then I want to tell what to do with the results. Okay, what do we want to do with the results? You know, comparing the code that we wrote yesterday. Okay. So I remember what, what the thing is that I did here. I checked if there is a result or not. So, or, or how many results there are. So in here I want to write an if statement and I'm going to say if. I could write it, well, I guess I could write it as an if statement, right? The other way I can write it, what's the other way that you can write a turn, write a write an if statement? Well, you can write it as a ternary, right? So because of the way this is, it works out, I could actually easily write this as a ternary. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and leave it as an if because I do want to have this product variable, um, but I could. So if there is results. And results dot length is one. Okay. Then I've got results. I've got exactly one result. I know I can show the view, right? So I can do the same kind of thing that I did yesterday. Let's grab the first result and render the product view using that product. Otherwise, I'm going to say, well, there's a 400 error. So I'm going to say res status. This is going to be a 404 error saying that the page or the resource is not found. So if you give me an invalid ID, I want it to show a 404 page. Um, one thing I forgot to do yesterday is I also want to set the type of that. Um, to tell that, that it's plain text and not HTML. So I'm going to write that as text plain. And then I'm going to send product not found. Why plain text? Um, well, for here, I'm just sending a single string, right? What I'm sending back is is just a string. The other way I could handle this is I could say status 400, and then instead of doing this here, I would render a view, right? So I could say status 404, and then render like a 404 error page. Does that make sense? 
So the reason the reason I'm just doing it as plain text is to just speed up the process um, rather than going through and creating a four or four page today. Um, just quickly creating a response. And and sometimes you do want that to come back as plain text. So I've got my logic there, right? Am I done? What happens if I have an error in my in my query? I catch it somehow, right? So so let's make sure we have a catch. So if there is an error, we're going to pass it on to next. One of the things we haven't done, and, and one of the places that this really shines, um, is it works a lot better once we want to say pull this database logic out in a separate file, uh, because that's kind of harder or more. Uh, there's some more gotchas if you're saying do that with uh, maybe callbacks uh, versus this with promises actually works really well if you want to break this up into multiple files. Cool. We'll be sharing the code now. Yeah, and yeah, sharing. Like, but, but like, not just like in Discord, but the whole. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll share the entire project. I'm trying to dictate along and send that yeah. all over the place. Yeah. So I'll, I'll share the entire project. Any questions on this? Um, I think we can go back to Yeah. Um, I said Okay. So you probably have not restarted VS Code. That's probably what's happened. You probably haven't restarted VS Code. Um, because the environment variables are picked up when your application starts, which VS Code is starting your node server, so it's it's having the same environment variables as when VS Code started. Okay. Any questions on Discord about this connect stuff or the configuration stuff? Uh, not for me. Okay. Sorry, I just that out. Why is this better than the city query? Uh, let's talk about that after I close up here. So that should be enough. I think with this is is enough that I want to just turn you loose on the labs to get going. Um, is there more? Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with connects um, and you can do with SQL. Um, so I would say, you know, read the documentation, read the documentation on the connects website. That will get you a lot of the ways there, um, answer a lot of your questions that you may have. Um, but I would say start with this much and you should be able to build a lot of your, a good part of your application already that you want to do for your lab. Cool. Sounds good. Okay. So the rest of the day, I just want you working on that database integration lab. Um, if you have any questions on your ERD, if you want to look, have me look over it, just send it to me or, or call me over. And I'll have a look at your ERD or your schema. Um, but but that's the kind of these are the these are the pieces that you need to kind of get started with your connection between MySQL and Node is is using the MySQL package and um, config and connects. Now you might ask because we installed connects, right? Do we need MySQL? Well, you still need the MySQL package because the connects package uses the MySQL package, so you still need both of those. Okay.